day four. And it's a beautiful day. Yesterday was cold. It was the first time this year I actually lit the fire. And it was great. But it was a cold day. Autumn had arrived. And today the sun's out. The wind is blowing. And as I look around, it's hard to believe that this evening the whole country is going into lockdown for a month. We are engaged with an enemy that we cannot see. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. I was looking this morning at the next couple of verses in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Yesterday, as we were looking, we considered the previous section, where Jesus has come down from the... Uh, Mount where he's delivered his great sermon to the great gathered throng and he has returned to Capernaum and as he's coming in he's come in he's uh, met with a centurion who pleads for the health and well-being of his servant boy and Jesus obliges him and so Jesus carries on and we pick the story up in verse 14 when Jesus entered Peter's house he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to serve him. Jesus has returned, it would seem, to home base. Although originally from Nazareth, he has shifted his operation, and he now operates out of Capernaum. Capernaum is on the northern shore, of the Sea of Galilee. It's almost, in a sense, as far away as you can get from Jerusalem and still be within the territory and still be accessible. It's right on the lake shore. And it seems that he's gone to Peter's house. It seems logical that Peter's house may be the place, this centre that Jesus operates out of. We discover that Peter is married. We know that because he has a mother-in-law. And you don't get a mother-in-law unless you're married. In this case, the mother-in-law is sick. She has a fever. It's not coronavirus. But I imagine in the days of Jesus that a fever itself presented a challenge. They didn't have the medicines or the medical treatments that we had today. And that all that... Each was left with was their own natural immunity and their faith to be able to fight off whatever it was that was attacking their bodies. She was laid low. She was in bed. She was sick. She wasn't able to do anything else. And we see that Jesus reaches out, touches her hand, and she is healed. The fever lifts her, leaves her, and she is made well. What we discover this about this is something of, of who she is. Because we read that she gets up and begins to serve him and, I would guess, the other of the band that had come with him, with Jesus. This is a woman who is not a malingerer. She is a hard-working type and her immediate reaction is to get up and to serve. I went for a flu shot yesterday, not just me, but the two others, uh, well, there's three of us all together, but two others of us who live in this house. Lynn, the third, who lives with us, this is my wife, is a practice nurse, and she's in the front line. So she's aware that we all need to be well, as well as we can be, to protect her, and if she brings a virus into the house, to be protected as much as we can be. And so the two of us went off to see her on the other side of town and to get flu shots. On the way, my two passengers were concerned about the efficacy and the safety of flu shots because it seemed that having flu shots was something that wasn't usually part of their agenda. They asked me if I had them. I have them regularly. Yes, I have one every year. Although there was a time when I didn't have them. 
early on I made a decision that if I didn't have a flu shot and I got the flu I could be in bed for a week and wallow in a little bit of self-indulgent misery knowing that there really was something wrong with me. Sad, I know. Sad. But here we have Peter's mother, mother-in-law, who gets up. She's not wallowing in, in illness. There really is something wrong with her. But she gets up and does what she can. There is now work to be done. Jesus not only relieves her of her illness, he also releases her back into life. And I think it's important in this passage to recognize that. My experience is that it's often in serving that we get our greatest level of satisfaction. It's because in serving so often we discover that our life counts for something, that we can be making a difference in the lives of others. And it seems to me is that when we recognize that as we serve others, that there are two beneficiaries, there is those that we serve and that there is us, that it is good for us, that something changes within us. When we acknowledge that we're not only doing it for them, that we're doing it for ourselves, it releases from us a capacity to do this with a measure of cheerfulness. Alternatively, we could serve out of a sense of obligation. We could serve out of a fear of judgment of others, of what they'll think of us if we don't. And what will that do? It likely will breed resentment and bitterness. We see that uh, kind of writ large in the story of Martha's encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus comes into her house and her sister Mary sits at the feet of Jesus while Martha runs around and gets into a flap. She's doing it out of a sense of, of obligation. She's doing it out of a sense of duty. She's not doing it recognizing that not only is she making a difference in others, it's actually also she's deriving some benefit from this. It seems to me is that when we recognize the blessing cuts both ways, that the possibility of joy sneaks in. Today is lockdown day. As I said at the beginning, our world will change. And the question that we might be invited to consider today is, what's required of us this day? What's required of me this day? How do I serve the needs of others? Well, one of the obvious ways is by obeying the rules that have been laid before us. But I want to suggest also that we all have opportunities for making a difference. And if we recognize that in making a difference, for other people, we are also likely to receive a blessing. We're able to do this with a measure of cheerfulness. All of us can make a difference. I reflected years ago, I had people coming into church on Zimmer frames, that everybody is called to ministry, everybody is capable of ministry. There's not one person among us who couldn't lift the phone and ring somebody and say something like, I've had you on my heart. just want to know how you're doing. And to check out with them, to be willing to listen, to be willing to engage, to be willing to share, and as appropriate, to be willing to pray. We can all pray. All of us are invited in some way to engage and ministry. It may be that you're sitting at home today feeling bereft. You may be thinking, I've got a whole month in front of me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do next? How am I going to fill this time? I don't want to be spending the whole time looking at reruns of Coronation Street. I want to do something more meaningful with my life. I don't want just the time just to go by. I don't want to just fill the time. I want this time to be rich and to be useful and to be life-giving. How do I do that? 
Well, I want to suggest that if that's a question for you, you might actually sit quietly and quieten your heart. Open yourself and open your hands, open your heart before God and simply ask the question, Lord, God, what is it that you have and might require of me today? And notice what comes. My observation is it's often the first thought that comes to mind that bears the seed of the answer. Sometimes it sounds ridiculous. Oh no, I could never do that. But it's worth considering. It's worth sitting with. It's worth holding and pondering. And you may discover the answer. You may hear arising quietly within your own heart the gentle of invitation of God into service and into life and discover in that a richness and a joy. May God bless you on this day, lockdown day.